One of the most neglected subjects in the Bible is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. You would think that as important as that subject is, that more people would be talking about it, more people would be referring to the Holy Spirit. But there are millions of people who sit in church week after week after week, year after year, never hear a single sermon dedicated to the Holy Spirit and His work in our life. When it's so crystal clear from the Scripture that you cannot live a godly life, you cannot serve the Lord adequately unless you understand how He works in your life. And you certainly cannot understand the truth of God's Word apart from the Holy Spirit. One of His primary responsibilities is to interpret the Word of God for us properly. And yet, sometimes you think, well, whose fault is that? Is it the people who sit in the pew or is it the men who stand in the pulpit? And I think primarily it is the men who stand in the pulpit. And the truth is not anyone who preaches the gospel apart from the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Spirit and the endowment of God's power upon his or her life doesn't make any difference who it is. Apart from the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be nearly as effective. It's not going to have the fruit that that work would have where the Spirit of God the one upon whom the speaker was depending to get the job done. It's his responsibility. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And for a lot of people, it's just sort of on one of those subjects, they just say, well, I talk about Jesus and God, and I don't know who this Holy Spirit is, because I used to read the Bible, and it talked about the Holy Ghost. Well, I can remember growing up, naturally, we only had the King James Version, and, they, and it was translated Holy Ghost instead of Holy Spirit. And I remember thinking as a kid, I'm not that ghost business. I'm not sure how, how I can handle that because uh, I didn't understand that. And so, and then, of course, some people think, well, the Holy Spirit's all about tongues. You have to speak in tongues. And so they just totally disregard it. The truth is, and I want to say it again, you cannot interpret the Word of God properly. You cannot live a godly life, and you cannot serve God adequately apart from the power of the Spirit of God working in your life. So what I want to talk about in this message is walking by the Holy Spirit. And I want you to turn, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5. And I want us just to look at a couple of verses here because... Um, there's so much that we could talk about, but I want to put it all in one message because I want you to get the full impact of how important the Holy Spirit is in your life as a believer. And if you'll notice in the fifth chapter of Galatians, here's what he says in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, what are the desires of the flesh? We're talking about those desires that find their source within that part of us that has a desire to live outside the will of God. In other words, when Paul speaks of the flesh, he's not talking about flesh and blood. He's talking about part of something within us. That is, when a person is saved, the Spirit of God comes into your life to dwell. And so we're transformed. We're brand new creatures in Christ. But that does not remove that propensity, that tendency at times that desires to do something outside the will of God to sin against God. And so when a person is living in the flesh, they are expressing that inner desire to do something, go somewhere, have some attitude that is not godly. We all have to deal with it every single day of our life. And so when he says here, I said to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Then if you look in the 25th verse of the same chapter, uh, Paul says again, if we live by the Spirit that is controlled by Him, dominated by Him, the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That is, if He is really in control of our life, let us walk by the Holy Spirit. Now, where we have to start is, we have to start in, first of all, answering the question, well, who is He? And somebody says, well, I don't know who He is. I know who Jesus is. I know who God is. I don't know who the Holy Spirit is. Or oh, I've heard that He's a person of the Trinity. Well, let's start where the Bible starts. And that is in the first book of the Bible, in the first chapter of the Bible, in the second verse of the Bible, you find the Holy Spirit hovering over this earth that is not totally complete. And then you find in the 26th verse, God says, let us make man in our image. Well, who in the world is us? Well, there's the Holy Spirit in that second verse. Us is also the Lord Jesus Christ, because if you notice in, um, 
If you notice in Colossians, for example, when Paul is talking about Jesus and uh, who he is and our response toward him, he says, For by him were all things created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, which simply says this, that this whole creation is involved with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity. So also you'll find throughout the Scripture that the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit. And in Zechariah, for example, that fourth chapter, the Scripture says, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. That is, that's the way we're to live, and that's the way we're to serve Him in dependence upon Him. Now, when you think about the Holy Spirit, somebody says, well, is He some force? Is that some biblical force? No, He's a person. And I want to show you in a few moments, if you turn to, look if you will, in John chapter 14, and you'll find that the qualities of a person, for example, that can think, that can reason, that has emotion, that can will, that can make choices and so forth. Look if you will in this uh, 14th chapter and the 16th verse, when somebody says, well, I don't believe in the Trinity. Well, how do you answer this question? John 14, 16, I, Jesus speaking, will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, and that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth. There's all the Trinity right there in those two verses. In the 26th verse, look at that. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So both of these verses give you the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity. Somebody says, well, do you all believe in three gods? No. There are three persons of the Trinity. There is one Godhead, one God, three persons. The Father does His work. The Son does His work. The Spirit does His work. And the work of the Holy Spirit is a vital part in every single believer's life. And it's tragic that people can go to church and listen to sermons year after year after year and never understand the work of the Spirit and wonder why they fail in their Christian life, why things don't work out, why God doesn't answer their prayer, why they feel so weak, why they're so tempted, why they yield, and on and on and on it goes. And there is a very specific reason for that. Because when you look to see the work of the Holy Spirit and who He is, and that He's a person of the Trinity, and that God has called Him and sent Him into your life and my life for some very, very specific purposes. So we're talking about someone whom the Father has sent into your life and my life because we could not be, nor could we become, nor could we ever accomplish what He has in mind apart from the Holy Spirit. If I were to ask you, what is the Holy Spirit, uh, who He is, that is, what is, what does He mean to you? And for many people, they'd have to say, well, uh, I, I know it's in the Bible because I read the Holy Spirit. Well, is He a person? Yes, He is. The Holy Spirit is as much a person as Jesus because the Scripture, if you'll notice, calls Him He and the Holy Spirit whom. And when you look at the work He does and what He does in your life and my life, He has to be a person. So the Holy Spirit is a vital part of every single believer's life. So I want us to look for just a moment. I'm going to take you through some of these verses just to sort of get you oriented here. And I want to start with this 14th chapter of John. And we just mentioned a couple of them here. And I want you to see what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And the helper here in the uh, Greek is parakletos, which means one who walks beside us, one who is, and he calls him here our helper. It is the same word translated comforter, so both of which mean that we have someone with us who helps us, who comforts us, along with some other things here. And you'll notice in verse uh, 26, he says, but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom, not it, which, but whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. That is, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is that he teaches us the truth. And unless the Spirit of God interprets the truth for us, it won't be correct. There are all kind of theologies and all kind of ideas and all kind of religions out there believe all kind of stuff because it's man made religion. Man-made theology apart from the work of the Spirit of God when there are no contradictions in this book. Now listen, 
He says, not only will He teach us all these things, but secondly, He will bring to your remembrance all that I teach you and all that I meant for you to understand. That is, He is also our reminder. For example, let's say somebody says, well, I'd like to witness to somebody. I'm afraid I'll forget the verses. Remember this. You have the Holy Spirit to remind you. One of His responsibilities is to remind us of the things we need to remember. And primarily, of course, that is the Word of God. Then if you will look in the 15th chapter and look in the 26th verse of this 15th chapter of John, he says again, when the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, he's often in the Scripture called the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. That is the work of the Holy Spirit is to, is to testify about who Jesus is, what he does in his place in our life. Watch this, the Holy Spirit never talks about himself. It's always about Jesus. That is part of His responsibility. Then if when you look at this 16th chapter and the 8th verse, here's another work of the Holy Spirit. You think, for example, that you got saved because you chose to be saved. Well, that's true to some degree. But uh, first of all, what got you realizing that you needed to be saved? You got under conviction. Verse 8 of the 16th chapter, when He, the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world. Listen, concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, and concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And so, but when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He convicts us of our sins. He is our teacher, and He guides us into all truth. And Verse 14 says, He will glorify me. That is, the Spirit of God is continually pointing us to Jesus and helping us to see who He is, how He fits into our life, and why we so desperately need Him. And so, when you look at all these verses, and then you come to Romans chapter 8. So, look at chapter 8 for a moment, and I want you to notice uh, a few verses here that are also so very important, because um, in Romans chapter 8, Paul describes in a few verses here a great deal. He says, for example, beginning in uh, verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells where? In you. Every single believer has the Holy Spirit indwelling Him. So watch this. Every single believer has a person of the Trinity indwelling us in our spirit. We, listen, we talk about being filled with the Spirit. A person is filled with the Holy Spirit when they are living in obedience to Him and following Him and walking in His ways. And so he says, the Spirit indwells us. Look, if you will, in the 14th verse. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. He not only guides us, but he, the Scripture says He leads us and indwells us. And in verse 15, for you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That is, He is the one who gives us assurance of our relationship to the Father. That is, the Holy Spirit testifies to every believer, you are, you are one of God's children. You have been adopted into the kingdom. And so we come to by that through the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we're the children of God, that is, bears witness. And, and for example, somebody says to you, well, are you saved? You say, I'm sure I'm saved. Why, why are you so sure? Well, you could give them a lot of reasons, but the real truth is the Holy Spirit bears witness, gives you assurance, reminds you that you trust that Christ is your Savior, reminds you of the promises of God. Therefore, you can with assurance say, yes, I know that I'm saved. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that does that. Then, of course, for example, if you turn to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, all the Scriptures here about the gifts, the gift of prophecy, the gift of uh, exhortation and giving and service and mercy and administration and all the rest, where does all that come from? Well, the Scripture says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now these are the varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. It is the same Spirit of God that gives these gifts. And you'll notice in verse 7, but to each one, that is to each believer, is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 
And for verse 8, for the one who's given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. And so it's very evident what's happening here. Then if you will turn back to Acts chapter 1 for a moment, and you'll recall we're talking about all the works of the Holy Spirit. You'll recall that uh, Jesus had taken His disciples for three years taught them all the things that he felt they needed to know. He performed miracles. He raised the dead. He healed bodies of all kinds of diseases. He taught them all kind of truth. And then he said to them at the end of three years, after they had been so shocked by the crucifixion and in a state of total disarray by understanding what's going on, now the resurrection has come. Remember what he said to them. He said, now look, you sit down in the city of Jerusalem. Sit down in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That is, you're, you're not ready, for example. And in the uh, 24th chapter of uh, Luke, he gives us uh, that part of, of, of the Great Commission. And then he says, uh, of course, in Matthew, gives us a Great Commission, and then also in Mark. But in Acts, look what he says now in verse um, 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. So what was he saying? He's saying simply this. Even though you've seen all this, even though you've heard all this, even though you've witnessed all the things that I've done, you're still not ready to do the work that I've called you to do until the Spirit of God indwells you. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon uh, God's servants and, and, and depart and come. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended to this earth to indwell all believers so that from that point on, every single person who is a child of God is indwelt by a person of the Trinity called the Holy Spirit. And so when somebody says to me, well, I'm just a nobody, I get all excited when they tell me that because I can't wait to tell them who they are. So look. You trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Then you're a child of God. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a person of the Trinity. I just go right down the line, and by the time I finish, they change their whole attitude. Listen, you can't be a nobody and be saved by Jesus. You can't be a nobody and be dwelt by the Holy Spirit. You can't be a nobody with ha having one in you to teach you, remind you, strengthen you. <laughs> go right down the list of all the things that we've talked about. And the reason I read that list is because I want you to see there it is in black and white in the Word of God. This is who He is. And this is what He's doing in the life of His followers. And so He intends for us to walk by His Spirit. Now, there are a lot of people, for example, uh, who say, well, now, uh, I think I, I try to do the best I can. I think about Sunday school teachers uh, who take their Sunday school lesson book, or maybe the Bible, and uh, they read the lesson, and they get, get it down pretty good, and they go to Sunday school class, and they teach the lesson. Who's the teacher? The Holy Spirit. Who's the equipper? The Holy Spirit. Who gives interpretation of the Word of God? The Holy Spirit. Listen, it is the power of the Holy Spirit within you. That's why He told them, you're not ready until the Spirit of God has come upon you. And then it is the authority of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the unction of the Spirit that teaches through a Sunday school teacher, through a pastor, through an evangelist, sings through a musician, you name it. God intends for all of us to do our work in His power, in His energy, in His strength, and by His authority. What is done apart from the Holy Spirit is flesh. It's man's own human effort. We can never carry out spiritual work, God's work, in the flesh, in our own energy, apart from the Holy Spirit. That is one of the primary reasons He sent the Holy Spirit. You may be a pastor, and you think, well, now I study, and I pray, and, and God gives me a message, and I just get up and tell it. And you ignore the Holy Spirit. You're not relying upon Him for wisdom. You're not relying upon Him for courage. You're not relying upon Him for inspiration. You're not relying upon Him for motivation. You're not relying upon Him for interpretation. You're not relying upon Him for power. You're not relying upon Him for authority. You cannot do what God has called you to do the way He intends for you to do it apart from the Holy Spirit. That's who He is. That's why He came. There's no substitute for the Holy Spirit. You can't put enough PhDs, THDs, RFDs, any other kind of Ds behind anybody's name and make them adequate to do the work God's called them to do. You cannot do it. 
And so I remember one of the most significant times in my life. I'd only been in seminary uh, a year, and I was in, in my second year, and I had a place over in the corner where I prayed in, in the living room and uh, in our very small apartment. And so I was praying one night, and the Lord just spoke to my heart crystal clear. I'll never forget it. Whatever you accomplish in life, you will have to accomplish on your knees in prayer. Not by education, but not by talent, not by gifts, by, oh, by calling out to me, crying out to me, it has to be on your knees. And God knew that that meant for me total dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Because you see, when you and I are praying right, He's involved. Because one of, listen, one of His responsibilities is in Romans chapter 8, 26, when He says the Holy Spirit prays for us and through us, intercedes for us, because we don't even know how to pray sometimes. Haven't you been on your knees and crying out to God for somebody? You didn't know what to ask. You just knew they were in trouble. You didn't know what to say. You just said, God, help them. Lord, I'm just trusting you to work in their life. The Spirit of God takes your prayer and interprets it, listen, personally, perfectly before the Father, because He knows our heart. Personally, the Trinity knows all things about all times, situations, and circumstances. And so, when I look at what He does and the awesome power available to us, I think, how foolish for us to try to do anything apart from the Spirit of God. Now, that's who He is. That's what He does. And the issue now is, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? How, how do we walk by the Spirit? Well, I want to put a definition up on the uh, screen here, and I want you to write it down, because every single one of us needs to understand this. Listen, to walk in the Spirit or by the Spirit, either way you want to call it, is to live moment by moment. Now, not today and maybe tomorrow. Moment by moment, what? In dependency upon Him, sensitive to His voice in our life and in obedience to Him. Those three words, dependency, sensitive to Him, and obedience. So, if I'm walking in the Spirit, you'll notice that I'm not doing that on Monday and then on Thursday and, next, and, and maybe next on Sunday. But how often? Come on, tell me, how often? <laughs> moment by moment. That is, every day of our life as a believer, I am to walk aware of the Spirit of God in our life. You say, well, now, how can we do that? How, how's that possible? Well, I'm going to talk about that. But... Um, what it's really saying is, I'm to live a godly life. You can go to church every Sunday. You can pray a little bit every once in a while. You can give a little money. You can read the Bible once in a while. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is living submissive to the Holy Spirit who indwells you for the purpose, the primary purpose of Jesus Christ living His life in and through us. That's why He came. He came to do in us and through us and for us what you and I could never do ourselves. And so to walk Listen, to walk by the Spirit is to walk moment by moment. Look, depending upon Him, sensitive to His voice in our life, and as a result of that, what's going to happen? We're going to live a godly life. We, we're going to live a life of obedience. So I hope you wrote that down. That's what walking by the Spirit, that's, that's the Christian life. Because would you not agree that if a person goes to church and listens to sermons, even takes notes, goes to work the next day and just curses somebody out. Well, you laugh because you've probably known a few folks like that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not Christian living. Now, I didn't say they weren't saved, but it's not Christian living. Because the Christian life is a life in whom the Holy Spirit is dwelling and through whom the Holy Spirit is expressing the life of Jesus. So, that comes to the whole question here of being filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? To be filled with the Spirit means that I'm totally submitted to Him, that He has His way in my life. Moment by moment, it's His way, not my way. Now, here is a big point. I want you to get this. How do we walk by the Spirit? That is, we know He's indwelling us. We know that he is doing all these things in teaching and guiding and leading and filling and empowering and convicting and enabling and all these things. Well, so what's my responsibility? It comes down to this, and that is if I'm going to live moment by moment in the power of the Holy Spirit, I must, listen, I must be sensitive, listen, to the initial promptings of the Spirit. Now, what do I mean by that? Simply this. Now, let's take, for example, let's say... You're a Christian, and uh, all of a sudden you see something that gets your eye or gets your attention, and you know that as soon as you see that or you look that way or whatever it might be, 
something inside us says, don't go that way. Don't head in that direction. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Or have you ever been driving and you going some, some particular direction, and all of a sudden you get this strong feeling, took a right right here. Well, where did that come from? Well, there's nobody in the car but you. That's the Spirit of God warning you of what's about to happen, which was a wreck. And God wants you to turn right. Listen, the Spirit of God within you speaks to your spirit. That is, with strong implications and strong inclinations. The Spirit of God arouses us to think and to think His way. The Spirit of God is an active person in our spirit, giving guidance and direction how we to live. Because He says, why did He come? To guide us, to lead us, and to empower us, and to reveal to us, and to impart truth, the truth of God's Word to us. And so, when I think about this whole idea of, of Him prompting us in the way He prompts us, He does so by strong inclinations. Now, somebody says, well, Suppose I don't, suppose He prompts me and I just keep going. Well, what would you call that? Let me ask you this. If you're a 12-year-old boy, you said to your 12-year-old son, take the trash out now. He says, I'll take it out, but I, but I got something else to do right now. I'll take it out later. What would you call that? That's just pure disobedience. In other words, that's disobedience. Now, here's the way many people live, and you don't realize this. If the Spirit of God prompts you to do something, obedience is that you do it when He says do it. Rebellion is when you do it when you want to do it, or you don't do it at all. And any way you cut it, it's disobedience. In other words, if the Spirit of God prompts you to do something, and you don't do it, give me any other word that best describes what you did than disobedience. A rebellion. It's not doing what God says do. That's what it is. And it's rebellion against God. So, when He prompts us to do something, how does He do that? He speaks to our conscience and to the, sp the Spirit within us. Now, watch this. The Spirit of God's never going to tell you not to do the right thing. It's always the right thing at the right time in the right way. Listen, the Holy Spirit is under no obligation to explain to me why. Well, why should I turn right here? Why, why shouldn't I turn? Because there's some things you and I can't see, we can't foresee. He's protecting us. And it, listen, it is foolish not to live moment by moment by the Holy Spirit because He's there for our benefit. Listen, by the way, God doesn't need any of us. He doesn't. He can get His work done without any of us. But He loves us enough to have sealed us as a child of God. And one of His works is to seal us under the day of redemption. He says that in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. He, the Spirit of God seals us. Now watch this. That means when you trusted Him as your Savior, the Holy Spirit came into your life to dwell. And not only does He come to dwell, but He seals you as a child of God. That is, you are forever a child of God. And as I say to my friends who do not believe that, and I'm sorry they don't believe it, here's what he says, in him you also, having listened to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, that is in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what's the promise? Here's the promise. Who has given us a pledge. Now listen, if I, if I promise you something and I pledge that to you, you expect me to fulfill it. But when God gives you a pledge and He seals you, He gives you a promise, He has awesome power to do anything and everything. He'll keep His promise. So here's what He says. He seals us in Christ who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. That is, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and my life, and His presence in your life, watch this, is God's seal in your life saying to you, I promise you, forever and ever and ever, you're one of my children. You may sin, and I'll have to chastise you for it. Forever, you're one of my children. Now, if the Spirit of God is the one who seals us and seals us within, who's going to break the seal? Now, for people who do not believe that they are saved forever, and they saved today and miss tomorrow, let me just say something. If you understood the work of the Holy Spirit, you would not believe that. And I'll tell you why. You claim to be a Christian. I don't question that. And uh, you read your Bible and pray, and you may sing in choir or play in orchestras or, or teach Sunday school lessons, all those things. And um, 
you just lose your temper, and I mean, you just have it out with somebody. Just let them have it. They did you wrong. According to what you believe, you suddenly broke the seal, you've lost your promise, and you are lost and on your way to separation to God. Oh, well, now, what I said wasn't really all that bad. Wait a minute now. Sin is sin, and disobedience is disobedience. The promise, the pledge of holy God is that once He seals you as one of His children, you are forever a child of God. You say, well, I'm not, and nobody's perfect. Nobody's talking about perfection. We're talking about being obedient to God. And what I want you to say is this, God's seal is God's seal. It isn't my seal. You can't, you can't break somebody else's seal. You're sealed forever, and the Spirit of God has equipped you to live a godly life. And we do that by moment by moment doing what? Getting our focus right on Him. Now, I wanted to say all of that because it's so very important for people who genuinely want to do what's right. They think they're saved today and lost tomorrow. You know what? When I was growing up in that kind of a church, I was afraid every day that uh, I, I probably did something that was wrong, and maybe I forgot about it, and I'd die and go to hell. That's what they said. And the day I learned the truth of what God said in His Word, I wanted to shout right in the middle of a class, in a Greek class, because I understood for the first time that I was forever a child of God. God judges sin. He chastises the sinner. He punishes the unbeliever. But for the child of God, the seal is there forever. And it's the work of the Spirit because it's His promise. Now, with that in mind, we think about there is going to be conflict. We got three enemies. Every morning you wake up with three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world system in which we live. Look at it, what a mess it's in. The devil, for example, and the flesh. That tendency within you that wants to do wrong at times in your life, it's there, it's going to be there until you die. And so we have three enemies. So, so how, how do we handle these three enemies? Well, Paul talks about resisting the devil, for example. He talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so here's what happens. When that tendency comes to think in the wrong direction, watch this now. Somebody says, I can't help myself. Let me tell you something. The devil can't make a single child of God do anything. He cannot make you. He will lead you. He will guide you, entice you, tempt you, but he can't make you. So, to walk in the Spirit means moment by moment what? Moment by moment, we are doing what? We're listening to the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. But if somebody says, well, you mean to tell me that I can live without sinning? How long can I live without sinning? Can you live five minutes without sinning? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Four people can. <laughs> now, uh, let's just think about what's the truth. Four, about four of you said you could live five. You know what? If I ask you if you could live ten minutes without sinning, there wouldn't be ten people stand up. Do you mean to tell me you sin every five minutes? That's what you said. You, you said five minutes. What about one minute? <laughs> you can live a lot longer than that without sinning. You know why? Because you have God living within you, guiding you, leading you. And if you will, listen, if you will yield to the promptings of the Holy Spirit of God, He's always going to lead you to do the right thing. I'm not saying you always will, but I'm simply saying we have the Spirit of God. That's, that's what walking by the Spirit is about. It's setting our mind in a direction because we're at war. And we're always going to be being attacked by your friends, by what you see, what you read, what you hear. All the things that are going on, the devil's there to mislead us and to misdirect us and to cause us to rebel against God. But because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, and we do, we do understand that we have a conflict, now the issue is this, what do I do about the Holy Spirit? So turn back, if you will, to uh, Romans chapter 8. And I want us to look in some earlier verses in Romans chapter 8. And I want you to notice uh, what he says in this passage. Let's begin in uh, verse 5. Now watch this, very important. For those who are living according to the flesh, that is, they're living by those desires that they have within them that are not of God. And those desires can be one of many things. So, 
For those who are living according to the flesh, watch this, set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are living according to the Spirit, they set their mind on things of the Spirit. Now watch this. Every single one of us sets our mind. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. We all have a mindset. There's some people get up every morning with a mindset. I'm, I'm going to do my best today. Somebody else sets up on the mindset, I'm going to do as little as I can today. Somebody says, I'm going I'm to reach the top if I have to step on them and mash them. In other words, everybody has a mindset of some sort. He says, now those who are living according to the flesh, that is, that internal feeling, I want to act outside the will of God, they're going to live by the flesh. Those who, by the Spirit, are going to live by the Spirit. Now watch this, verse 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, death to the things of God. The mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on, watch this carefully, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Do you get that? Hostile toward God. When you and I set our minds on doing things that we know are not right, here's what he says. He says, your attitude at that moment is hostility toward God. No, no, wait a minute. I love God. No. He says, if you choose deliberately to sin against God, you're acting hostile toward God. Because the will of God for your life is a life of righteousness and obedience. So he says, he says, for the spirit set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are living in the flesh cannot please God. So, that being the case, it makes me want to know, okay, if that's the case, how do I live according to the Spirit? And so, we have a battle. Now, watch this carefully. Every single one of us has two battles every time we come to some temptation. First of all, there's a battle in the mind. Secondly, there's the battle in our behavior. If you don't win the battle in the mind, you're going to lose the battle in your behavior because what the mind thinks governs everything. Governs what you see, what you hear, how you speak, walk, handle, you name it. The first battle in temptation is the battle in the mind. So I have to have a mindset. I choose to obey God. I choose not to walk that way. I choose not to look at that. I choose not to give to that. I choose, I choose not to withhold that. That is, we have a mindset. And so there's a battle that's going on. And we win that battle as a result of doing what? Yielding to and responding to the initial prompting of the Spirit. Now, if the Spirit of God says, don't go that direction, and you just keep traveling, don't go that direction, don't go that direction, don't go that direction, you, you still travel. What you're doing is, you're, listen to this word, you're acting hostile toward God who loves you and who has the best plan available for you, and you're heading in the wrong direction because you have chosen to do so. It's disobedience. It's rebellion. It's hostility toward a loving God who came to this earth and laid down His life in order that you might be saved. It's hostility toward God. You can name it. You can camouflage it. You can paint it. You can use any kind of vocabulary you want to. It's hostility. That's what God says. I didn't say it. So you have to decide, am I going to walk by the Spirit or by the flesh? If I want God's best, I'm going to have a mindset. In 1 Peter, listen to what he says. He says in this uh, first chapter in the 13th verse, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Listen, prepare your minds for action. And in Colossians, uh, the third chapter, listen to what he says. It's the, same, it's the same sort of thing. Here's what he says. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above. Have a mind set on things that are good, and righteous, and holy. He says, uh, where Christ is seated at the Father's right hand. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. We have a mindset. For example... You say, well, how do I do that? Well, tomorrow, let's just take tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, before you get out of bed and you wake up, you set your mind on the things of God. Today, Father, he's the first one you ought to talk to anyway. Father, I want you to guide me today and lead me. I want to listen to you. Speak to my heart. Make me sensitive to what's going on around me and the people I meet and so forth. That is, that you'll develop your own little message of setting your mind. So what happens? You're starting the day out with a mindset. 
You've set the direction for your life, and it's the Holy Spirit who is going to awaken you to remind you of that, because you know what? You're going to think about that tomorrow morning. You say, how do you know I am? Because I'm going to pray you'll get so upset. If you don't, you will. <laughs> to have a mindset. Because listen, there are people who wake up with a mindset of adultery. There are people who wake up with a mindset of stealing. They wake up with a mindset of lying, of what they, what they intend to do that day. There are people who wake up with all kinds of mindsets. Set your mind, he says, on the things above, where Jesus is sitting at the Father's right hand. Because we can set our mind, and the Holy Spirit will enable us to do it. It's His will that we do it. And that's why the Word of God is so very, very precious to us. Why? Because this is the way we think. You don't, listen, you don't read and meditate on the Word of God. You know what you're going to do? Listen, you sit at home, watch TV, program after program after program after all the kind of propaganda and all the things that have absolutely nothing to do with things that are spiritual. And then you go to bed and you think, well, I'm going to wake up and talk about Jesus. I doubt it. You know why? Because you just programmed your mind. You know what you did? You fed that part of you that's ungodly. You fed that part of you with all the stuff that goes on. Why would anybody want to watch stuff that instigates, stirs them up, and arouses things within them that are totally ungodly? Because there's something in them they want to feed. And what he's saying is, starve it to death. Set your mind on the things of God, on the things that are on high. The things that, the, the things that match who you are. You're a follower of Jesus. Our life is a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we owe Him our life. He died for us. He gave us the gift of salvation and eternal life. We owe Him everything. How can we involve ourselves and allow ourselves to head in directions that we know is not right? The Spirit of God prompts us, do not go there, do not do that, do not think that, don't not let, look at that. We do it anyway. Remember this, any way you cut it, it is rebellion, it is disobedience, and it's hostility toward God. You want to live a godly life? Have a mindset that is godly. So that when somebody crosses you, your mindset is, Lord, I'll get you back. Your mindset is, thank you very much, Lord, let's forgive them for that. I'm just going to overlook that. I won't pay attention to that. In other words, godly people don't live like the ungodly. And when, listen, when we are walking in the Spirit, there is an absolute, definite difference in our life. Your friends may not understand it. They think, well, you just think you're something. No, we don't think we're anything. We know that we're children of God. That's who we are. And we know that we are inadequate within ourselves to do anything that has any real value. We trust the Holy Spirit. We depend upon Him. We rely upon Him. We're sensitive to Him. We acknowledge Him. We obey Him. Why? Because we've learned that's the best way to live. It's the only way to live with real peace and happiness and joy and contentment in your life. And it's the way God intends for us to live because He came to live through us that kind of life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's who He is. And I would simply say this to you. Why, why did David say he loved to meditate upon God's Word? Because, you see, he had a mindset. And we see in his life when he, when he turned away from that mindset, what kind of trouble he got into. You and I have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in a way that he didn't even understand, could not have understood at that time. You are indwelt by a person of the Trinity, Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, who is here to enable us, equip us, manage us, guide us, lead us to do anything and everything that it is his will for us to do and to accomplish in life. You say, well, I'm just a homemaker. There's no such thing as just a homemaker. You happen to have one of the biggest jobs I know of. If anybody needs the Holy Spirit in their life, it is a mother. Look what you have to do. You have to take care of the children, plus you have to take care of your husband. Sometimes put up with him. But in other words, <laughs> you, you, have a, you have an awesome job educating your children, keeping home, all the hundreds and hundreds of tasks that you have. The Holy Spirit is just as, listen, He's just as available, ready, and desirous to help you to be a godly mother as He is to help any pastor preach a godly sermon. That's who He is. So here's the choice you have. You can set your mind on the things of God and trust this indwelling person of the Holy Spirit who has promised to guide you, lead you, enable you, equip you, give you authority, and all the other things that we've mentioned. 
Here you have the Holy Spirit living within you, ready to live through you the very life of Jesus Christ, which means that your attitude and your actions are going to be godly. It's a choice we make. You say, well, what do I have to do to get all that done? Just surrender. <laughs> Just yield. Just tell him, okay, God, I give up my way. I want your way. What does he do? He takes over. Now, is it not true that's what you want your children to do? You want them to trust you and obey you. Why? Because you know what's best for them. And you, and you give your life for them. He's already given his life for us. To walk in the Spirit. Is to do what? Is to depend upon Him totally. To rely upon Him. To be sensitive to what He's saying to us. And to obey Him. That is life at its very, very, very best. And it's available to every single person who wants God's best. Father, how grateful we are for your awesome love for us. And to think that you've done so much in preparation for our daily life, that we can wake up with you, live with you, and go to bed with you every night with perfect assurance that we have your favor, knowing that you forgive us when we're weak, and knowing that our heart's desire is moment by moment to walk by your Spirit. That is my prayer, Father, for every person who hears this message. Let there be some radical changing going on in people's attitudes. Radical changing about sin that they put up with and thought, to God, that you paid no attention to it. And radical right doing because they want your best. I pray the Holy Spirit seal this message, execute it in every life, arouse the conviction so that all that you desire for us we'll have the wonderful privilege of enjoying. In Jesus' name, amen. And we give an invitation for people to express their decision, one of which, for example, is to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And you do that by asking Him to forgive you of your sin. Not, not, not that, well, Lord, forgive me of my sins, but you come to the realization you've sinned against God. You're part of what put Him to the cross. He died on the cross, shed His blood. Listen, paid your sin debt in full for your eternal life. Makes it possible for you to be a child of God. And the moment you do that, then everything else we've talked about can be a reality in your life. Until you give yourself to Him in salvation by faith, none of this other works. But it's yours as a choice.